Hi guys, and welcome to a Hector Lecture Guide to the Fight P8S Phase 2. This is Hephaestus. Before this fights begin, there's quite a few positions you need to agree on. First, you should have a rough set of spread positions. I recommend doing tanks, then melees, then healers, then range to make this easier. You're also going to need to be able to adapt these spreads to be on either side of the arena. You can just go in lines, or you can sort of zigzag it to make them a little bit more comfortable. You're also going to need roll spread positions that you'll use for a few mechanics. These should be tanks and healers on the left, DPS on the right, each with their own square. Whether or not you choose to do it like this or like this with healers in range in the middle is entirely up to you. This version here comes with the advantage of easier healing and ranged like casters having to move less, but the other version can be a bit simpler in terms of uptime. Finally, you need an in-out priority system for both your tank healers and your melee ranged. In my version here, I have it where H2 and R2 are prioritized to be the most in player, all the way up to main tank and M1, who are prioritized to be the most out player. With everything sorted, let's go over the fight. The first thing you need to know is that the tank autos in this fight cleave. Not just cleave, but they're stacks. Which means that for these to be survivable comfortably, you need to have both of your tanks stacked together and expect them to take a lot of damage. After a few of these stacking mini tank buster auto attacks, the boss will cast a raid wide. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it. The raid wide hits for pretty heavy damage, but also gives a very spicy bleed on all players, so make sure that you're watching everyone's health as it's going to keep dipping. There's a few more of these tank autos before the boss casts Tyrant's Unholy Darkness. This targets the top two players in aggro for a tank buster, so tanks need to spread apart and take this with cooldowns. I recommend that you have your main tank here use their invulnerability, so that after they get hit, they can take the next tank autos by themselves, and underneath their invuln, you can maximize the effectiveness of the invuln. There's two more autos here, and then the boss will start to cast Natural Alignment. This is the first major mechanic of the fight. Natural alignment will always target two players, either both supports or both DPS, with a purple circle underneath them and a debuff that looks like that. Those players should immediately move away from the party. These players are constantly taking a very heavy dot that cannot be mitigated and needs to just be healed and shielded through throughout the entire duration of this mechanic, about 45 seconds. Additionally, if these players ever die or take damage outside of their dot, the party will instantly wipe. Twist Nature is what's going to start off this mechanic. And when Twist Nature goes, one of the two player circles will start to spin and you'll see bars above their head, one for stack and one for spread. Now, one of these bars will start to fill first and that's the first of the two mechanics to go off, in this case, spread. I'm gonna show you two different ways to deal with the stack spread. The first one involves everybody just staying middle and spreading according to these spread positions. <laughs> In this pattern, because we have spread, what we do is first wait for Tyrant's Flare, which are puddles, to go off, and as soon as they appear, we try to spread out, adjusting for the players that are missing because of natural alignment. As long as you're spread like this, it's tight, but there's room for you to survive. Immediately afterwards, the boss will cast Ashing Blaze, and everybody needs to dodge to the correct side of the arena. Whichever side is not on fire, that's the safe side, and you do the second mechanic, in this case, Stack. Now, here's another way to do this that I found is a little bit more comfortable if you get spread first. In this pattern, we do it based off of our roll spreads. We take those positions, we slide them down. If you want to, you can swap it to look like this to make it a little bit easier to heal, but I'm going to show it just with the most simple, using the same pattern every time. These players stack instead in two separate groups and are going to spread to their spread positions from these positions. Now, put our natural alignment pliers back up, and here's the same mechanic, but done in this manner. The puddles appear, and because everybody's moving 90 degrees away from each other, there's much more room and it's a lot more comfortable to do the spreads. Entirely up to you how you deal with it. Afterwards, the stack will be exactly the same. Dodge to the correct side and stack up. However you deal with the stack spreads, afterwards, we get another natural alignment combo. First, three clones appear, and there's always gonna be one that's missing. That's the safe lane. The safe lane will either be the first or second row. 
Secondly, the other natural alignment starts to spin, and we get ice and fire bars that will fill up. Fire will target three players with a two-player stack, and this will always be on the furthest three players from the purple player. Ice is three player stacks, but targets the two closest players. So fire, three groups of two, ice, two groups of three, and for both of them, we need to make sure that there is a player closer and a player that's further away to make sure we bait these correctly. I'm gonna show a method known as one tile strats as how my group deals with this. For fire positions, it's 10 healers left, DPS right, and our healers in range get to prioritize the nearer to the middle line between four and D. If you look at the two-way mark, the line that's on, healers in range are always going to be basically right next to that line, barely moving at all. Tanks and melees go either to the far north or far south of the square that we need to be in. Here's what those fire positions look like if we need to be in the second lane instead. As you can see, we followed our in-out priority to make sure one player's in and one player's out, and to be absolutely certain that we've got the right distance, in players are in the square, out players are just behind the line in the next square over. Now, if you've got your natural alignment player stacked middle, you'll see that either a tank or melee is going to have to usually adjust up to make sure that we're still in three groups of two. Now let's look at ice positions. For ice positions, we're more or less just gonna stack where the healers in range always do for fire positions, but because we need to be in two groups of three, we need to have one player just across. This player will always be M1 or main tank. So here, if the natural alignment are on healers and tanks, M1 adjusts across in the far position, and now we have ourselves perfect ice positions. H1 and R2, in this case, are the ones baiting the ices, and we're in groups of three. If instead we have DPS in the ice positions, it's main tank who's adjusted across again in the far position. I recommend having your adjust player be the far player, so they're always far, and they only need to think about do I adjust or not, not do I need to be in or out. Additionally, note that unlike fire, the natural alignment players can't stand in the middle of the tile. They should go to the far edge of the tile to make sure they don't get clipped and instantly wipe the party. Here's the same ice positions, but in the north. Most players stay right on that middle line, and it's just the natural alignment players that have to move a bit further. If you don't find this comfortable and you're too worried about getting clipped, you can stretch this over two tiles, but I'll show this entirely as if it was done with the one tile strat. So. Here we have a combo where we see that fire is going to be the first one, and the safe lane is the second lane. We immediately get into our fire positions in the second lane, and the fire stacks go off. Once the first clones bait, a new set of clones appears on the east side of the arena, and now you need to move up to the other lane. If the second lane's safe first, the first lane is safe second. If the first lane is safe first, then the second lane is safe second. It's only the top two lanes we do this in. So immediately move into the others and get into your ice positions. Don't forget if you're M1 or main tank, you may have to be the one to adjust across so that we're in groups of three. I'm just gonna show you the entirety of natural alignment again, but I'm going to swap things over so you can see the other versions of how this could go. So here we've got two DPS have natural alignment and everybody else goes into their side puddle positions. We're going with the roll stack version of this. Twist nature goes off and we see the stack spread bar. We look to see which one fills first, and it's stack this time. So as a result, everybody's going to stack middle after the puddles bait. The puddles come, and everybody stacks middle. Had we instead all been middle originally, what most groups do is they just move together north, but you can agree any position where everyone's gonna go to to do the stack. After the stack, look for the unsafe side, and we do our spread, but it's the sort of line spreads that I showed earlier. You can sort of offset them from each other if you want to have even more room for this, but make sure everybody's on the safe side. Next up, we all get near to 4 and D, and we look to see which lane is safe. It's the top lane. We wait to see, is it fire or ice that starts to fill first as we head to that top lane, and we see that it's ice filling first. So, natural alignment players go all the way to the top, and main tank adjusts across. Now we know we're getting fire next, and the safe lane is the second lane, so natural alignment go in the middle, our main tank comes back across, and we get into our fire stack positions. And that's natural alignment. When natural alignment p finishes, we get another raid wide with a heavy bleed, and tanks should be positioned together as there's some more tank autos before we get another tank buster. Take it separately. This time there's only one tank auto afterwards, so I don't recommend wasting an invuln on this. Just immediately afterwards have your tanks collapse together and healers make sure they've got enough health to survive one more tank auto together. 
Next, we get what many will consider to be the most confusing mechanic of this fight, the real big puzzle one, High Concept. For those of you familiar with Hello World from the Omega Raids, this will seem pretty similar. For High Concept, make sure that you heal, shield, and heavily mitigate this as this hits for incredibly hard raid-wide damage. For every player that's dead, that damage gets spread amongst the other players equally, so if you have a single player dead, you either need more mitigation than you were expecting, or maybe even a tank LB. Either way, when High Concept goes off, everybody gets some buffs, and things start to get confusing. So let's break things down. Here's how alchemy works. If your player has either an alpha, beta, or gamma debuff, when the timer expires, they explode in a large circle, and they get colors above their head, depending on which debuff they just had. If a player without a debuff, is stood in one of these AoEs, they will also take damage, and they will also get the same set of colors above their head. At different points in time, towers will appear, and those towers will have a specific color to them. It's as simple as this. If that color is one of the three above your head, you can combine with someone else that has that color above their head to make a purple creature, and therefore soak that tower. Here are the two players with purple stacked together. They both get a purple creature, and they both go into their tower. Here's this working instead with blue towers. The two players with blue above their head stack together. You have to wait a few seconds. You'll see yourself start to tether. Wait until you see the creature symbol above your head, and now you can go into your towers. Finally, here's what it looks like if you've got green towers. The two players with green above their head stack together, wait for the tethers to make the creatures, and then go in the towers. Now, there's one additional rule to this. Suppose we get blue towers, but we have this combination of colors here. You might think that any three players can combine together to make the blue, but there's a problem. If you share not one color, but all three colors, if you have the exact same pattern like H1 and off tank do, instead of making the one you want blue, it defaults to the dominant color, the, uh, the one that's got the little outline around it, in this case, red. And so instead of making the blue creature you want, you get Ifrit. If this happens, if you're not, if you're getting Ifrit or there's a tree and there's a snake you can also get, for High Concept 1, this is just a fail condition. You're going to get a really spicy dot on both of those players, and you're not going to be able to capable of completing the mechanic. So f assume that for all of High Concept 1, if you have the exact same combo as someone else, you can't combine with them. So now let's go through the mechanic. When High Concept 1 goes off, survive the raid wide with heavy mitigation and shielding, and we get the debuffs on the side over there. There's two players each with alpha, two players with beta, two players with gamma. One person has a three-person stack symbol, that's H2, and one person has a two-person stack symbol, that's main tank. Within each alpha, beta, and gamma, there's a short and a long timer. So here's where everybody goes. If you have a short timer, alpha goes to A, beta goes to B, gamma goes to C. If you have the two-person stack symbol, you go to the two-way mark. If you have the three-person stack symbol, you go to the three-way mark, which also has the one-way mark underneath it on my version. Finally, the last three players are here to sort out the stacks. We need two other people to stack with H2 and one person to stack with main tank. My suggestion is beta's a yellow debuff, beta goes to yellow marker, beta still goes to a yellow marker. So have beta stack with your main tank and alpha and gamma stack with whoever needs the three. This satisfies both. We wait for the boss to cast Arcane Control, and everything's going to explode. If you don't have the right numbers or any of these AoEs overlap, it's an instant wipe. But if you're in these correct positions, then we get some colors, and we move on to the next step. The boss will spawn two towers, and just like I showed previously, if you have that color above your head, group with the other person, make that creature, and get ready to soak a tower. In terms of who soaks which tower, I recommend you have it where Alpha always goes to the North Tower, Gamma always goes to the South Tower, and Beta adjusts, depending on who they combined with. During these towers, boss casts Ashing Blaze, so everyone needs to move to the safe side, and those in the towers need to make sure they're on the safe side of their tower. To know when you need to be in your tower by, it's the same pink circle countdown you saw in P5S. They count 10 seconds. As soon as it gets to 10, you need to be in your tower, because that's when everything goes off. Now, we need to get into our second positions. If you have something above your head, go to the safe corner where the stacks happened. Make sure you're not too near to each other because you're still capable of tethering 
and combining together, and if that happens, explosions go off and we wipe. If you have a long debuff, alpha, beta, or gamma, you're now just going to go to A, B, and C, the same as if you had the short debuff. The tricky bit is the last two players, the players that have the two-person and three-person stack. See, what we need to do next is make sure we have two of every color combo. We're about to get one of each from the alpha, beta, and gamma when they explode. We also will always have one of them left over, the person who didn't uh, mix together and combine to make a creature on the first set of towers. The last two colors, that's the players that have the stacks job. So H2 and MT are going to go to alpha and beta, stand near enough to get the set of colors to make sure we have enough to make the next set of towers. In terms of where they should go to, I recommend a priority system like this. H2, or whoever had the three-person stack, looks at alpha and then beta. If they can go to alpha, they go to alpha. If they can't go to alpha, they skip it and go to beta. Main tank does the same thing, whoever had the two-person stack, but they look at gamma first and then go to beta if they have to. Since in this version, alpha and beta were what combined together, they're what we need. Gamma is the one we're going to skip. If you forget this in the, the, the moment, you could have whoever has the symbol above their head call out and say, skip gamma, because they have gamma above their head still, or you can always just look at the colors that are floating above their head. Whatever main color is left, that's the one you skip. In any case, in this version here, they're gonna skip gamma and stand next to alpha and beta. Arcane control goes off. And as a result, we now have two of every color combo. There are four towers, all the same color. We have to be careful because while we have four blue players, you can't combine with somebody with the exact same combo, but there's an easy way to fix this every single time. If you had a long debuff, you go south. If you weren't a long debuff player, you stay north. This will ensure that we never have two players that have the exact same combination together. Combine with your player. We get four of the creatures, and you can either use a priority system or callouts to make sure that you each soak a different tower. Don't forget to dodge the Ashing Blaze, and you've completed High Concept 1. Make sure to not get too close together. You can still tether until the boss cast deconceptualize. At this point, all of the buffs and debuffs disappear. Be prepared to heal and mitigate through another raid wide. Have your tanks away from the group as they have some tank autos. And after three tank autos, the boss will cast Limitless Desolation, and we want to get into our roll stack positions. This is a pretty basic mechanic as far as savage mechanics go, and much simpler than most of the rest of the fight. We're essentially going to get four pairs of AoEs, immediately followed by a tower that spawns. These AoEs will always target some a tank healer and a DPS, and the towers will always spawn one on the left, one on the right. So whoever gets hit first, find the tower on your side, that's the tower you're going to soak. Your tower doesn't go off for quite a while afterwards, and you have to bait a puddle before you can get in, so stand near to your tower, but not in it. On the lines at the edge or in the middle of lanes are recommended. Second set of AoEs and second set of towers, so they move near it. Third set of AoEs, third towers, and this is where the first puddles go off. As soon as you see your puddle, that's the cue to get in your tower. Before those towers explode, we get our fourth AoEs, our fourth towers, and now the towers go off. More puddles, they hop in their tower, Third set of puddles, third set of towers. Fourth set of puddles, fourth set of towers. Because of debuffs you get, you can't go out of order, so if you're hit first, soak the first towers that appear. But because you can move freely, there's really not much difficulty to this. Just adjust around. It looks a little bit messy, but there's no need to overcomplicate this. There's another raid wide. Some more tank autos. And then another tank buster. Because you get two tank autos after this, I recommend making sure your off tank has aggro for this and having them use their invuln. Their invuln should still be up for both of the tank autos afterwards. Now we get another natural alignment. This is pretty similar to the first one with a couple of key changes. The big difference is if you look over at the bar where your debuffs are, in addition to the natural alignment, the boss will cast inverse magics and give one or both players this purple debuff here. If the player has this debuff, it just flips the order of their mechanics. So if you see the bars fill stack then spread, if they have the purple debuff, it's spread then stack. If it's on both of the natural alignment players, it's pretty simple, just do the reverse both times. Where it gets tricky is when there's only on one. 
With this, you need to look at the purple circle underneath their feet, see which one is spinning to go, ah, that's the player whose mechanics are going off, and then check whether or not they're reversed or not. Twist nature starts to happen. And so for instance, here we have off tank is spinning, and because off tank has the purple debuff, we know to do the opposite of what we see. If we see stack fill, then spread, we do spread, then stack, and the opposite. Here we see we need to be in the top lane, and we start to see stack fill before spread. That means we do spread then stack because it's reversed for off tank. Everybody goes up, and you can just spread in your roll stack positions. You might find it easier to instead rotate these so that you've got healers in range middle. However you want to do it is fine. But be in spread where you're two per tile, one in the north, one in the south. The spreads go off, and now everybody's going to stack in the other lane. Make sure your natural alignment players are away from the middle. Everybody else can be just stacked middle. Now that off tank's out of the way and they were the only one with the reverse debuff, we can just do everything exactly the way we see for H1. And fire and ice comes up next, and it's exactly the same as the first time. Look for the safe lane. It's fire first, so have natural alignment middle and everybody else in fire positions. Then adjust into the other lane to deal with ice. At the very end of this, there's an ashing blaze, but there's nothing else actually going on, so just look and dodge to the other side. Not really sure why this is here. We get one more raid wide here with its bleed, some tank autos, and one final tank buster. You're unlikely to have an invuln left unless you have a warrior in the party, so take this with cooldowns and don't forget to stack up for a final tank auto together afterwards. Next up, is high concept two. Once again, heavy mitigation is required and shielding, and make sure that you've got everyone alive because it does more damage the more players that are dead. As the explosion goes off, we get debuffs. This time, we get three players with the alpha, beta, gamma short debuff and three with alpha, beta, gamma long debuff. Two of the long debuff players are gonna have a one person stack and a two person stack debuff. The uh, one person stack debuffs on M2 this time, and the two-person stack is on M1. Here's how what we do. If you have a short debuff, go to A, B, and C, same as we did in High Concept 1. If you have the solo stack, the one-person stack, go to the one three-way mark together where they are. If you have the two-person stack, go to the two-way mark. Finally, if you still have a debuff, if you're that long debuff player that's left over, you also go to the two so that the two-person stack doesn't die. Finally, the two players that have no debuff both need to go and stand next to Alpha. Arcane Control goes off. We get an explosion of everything and two towers spawn. Now, before we deal with those towers, which are very similar to High Concept 1, let's talk about the two players that had no debuff. They now have the alpha color combo. They want to stay stacked together and immediately combined to make Ifrit. For High Concept 1, this was a fail. For High Concept 2, this is necessary. Be warned, this comes with a very spicy dot, so healers watch out for their health. For everybody else, we do this the same as High Concept 1. You see purple towers, you see purple above your head, combine, make your purple animal, watch out for the Ashing Blaze, and Soaker Towers. Now, for second positions, if you have something above your head, just like before, go to where the stacks were. Remember to not get too near to each other so you don't accidentally tether together and explode. If you had the long timer debuff, it's the same alpha to A, beta to B, gamma to C. Arcane Control goes off, the explosions happen, and nobody should get clipped except for Alpha, Beta, and Gamma. Now, a bunch of things appear all at once, and this can look confusing, but the good news is that it's entirely fixed how we're going to deal with this. We get four towers in the middle, two of which are always green, and we get four clones around the outside. Let's deal with the towers first. If you have on, are on Alpha or Beta, you will always combine together on the east side. If you are Gamma or the person who's left over, you combine together on the west side. You're always gonna, by this pattern, make the four animals that you need, and from here you can just adjust to make sure you're each in one tower. Uh, you can try to stick to, if you came from north, go north, but because these towers aren't always diagonal from each other in this pattern, you may have to adjust. Now, now that the towers are dealt with, let's deal with the clones. Two players, don't have Ifrit. They have a different animal. Those players are going to go in front of the north and south clone, and we're going to match the tower they soaked. 
So off tank sort of soaked the north tower, R1 soaked the south tower, they go north south. The other two players are the players with Ifrit. They're going to go near the east and west clone. You can have a priority system, but it's easier to just take the huge amount of time you have to either call it out or adjust relative to each other. So main tank has been non-verbally communicating. They're going to go east for the entire time while H2 is hugging near the west. Once you're in front of a clone, about the same time that the towers count down to five or halfway before they need to be soaked, these clones will tether to the nearest player to them. From this point in time, you can now move them if you're tethered to it. Drag those clones all the way to the left, facing inwards, and then move one step forward. By doing this, when the clones go off at the same time as the towers, they all shoot a line AoE, none of the towers get hit by a line AoE, and every player only gets hit by one of the line AoEs. Healers, watch out for your Ifrit players. They're taking the line AoE, and they already have a spicy dot, so they're going to have a lot of damage going out here. With this all done, we're almost home free. Immediately have an Ifrit player and a bird player stacked together. That's red and green. When both of these are stacked together, their buffs change instead to this Phoenix Feather. The boss will start to cast Ego Death, which will wipe the party unless we can stop it. Make sure the entire party is healed entirely to full health, as mitigation and shielding will not protect you from this upcoming attack. Your Phoenix Feather is going to explode, dealing 99.9% .9 of health damage to every single player, but replacing them, their original buffs, with this Phoenix buff. Ego Death will finish. The screen will go black, and you may think that the fight is over, but if you have the Phoenix buff, every player will rise from the ashes, and the fight continues. In addition, Every single player is going to get a new buff that massively increases their damage and makes it easier for you to deal with the DPS check. All that's left to deal with is the Soft and Rage. The boss starts by casting Ionagonia. This is a heavy raid wide that also has a bleed and gives the boss a stack of damage up, meaning that this is going to get harder to heal through every single time it goes off. This is followed by Dominion, another hard raid wide that we need to be spread for. You can go for a spread like this to make things easier on your healers, but if this is too difficult to remember a completely new spread position, this still works if you're in your roll stack positions. Either way, make sure everybody spread out roughly on their own tile, because four players are about to get targeted with the same sort of spike pillar that you saw during phase one. Those four players get an earth resistance down, and they're not going to take part with the next mechanic immediately. The other four players should get positioned roughly with their in-out priorities, with tank healers going left and DPS going right. There's about to be four towers to soak, and how these appear is as little light beams with cracks. They start to crawl near the edge, really slowly, just follow yours and make sure there's one player in each of the towers. You can call out left-left or right-right if you want to make sure that you're definitely each going to different towers. Those players get earth resistance down, but the other debuffs fall off, and we get a second set of Dominion. Once again, now these players that couldn't soak the first set soak the second set. Same priorities. Shortly afterwards, another Ionagonia goes off to heal and mitigate through. This is followed by another Dominion, which we deal with exactly the same way as the first one. All in all, there's three Ionagonias and two Dominions to deal with. If we look at the timings for this, here's a rough way to deal with the mitigation for it. First off, if you split your reprisals, you can have a reprisal and your shield healer's short cooldown on every single Ionagonia. Secondly, if you look carefully, the Dominions are always 10 seconds after Ionagonias, which means that some of your mitigations like Shield Samba, Expedient, uh, Holos, these have longer durations, and therefore you can comfortably get them to cover both an Ionagonia and a Dominion. Throw on the rest of your mitigations, and here's just one example of how you could mitigate through all this, but make sure you discuss this with your group in advance so you know how you're going to survive the huge amount of damage going out. After all of that goes off, the boss will cast one last Ego Death, and this is your last chance to clear, as this serves in the Enrage. Kill the boss before it goes off, or it's lights out. And that's it. That's the entirety of Phase 2. Can I just say a massive thank you to everybody who supported this channel as it's grown. I've really appreciated all of your comments and feedbacks and suggestions and help in improving strats over the tier. So once again, 
really thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, as always, if you see anything that I've done not quite right or better ways of doing mechanics, please let me know so I can try to help others to see better ways of doing this. Thanks so much, guys. Take care.